Hello again and welcome to Crime in Music. I'm your host, Brian J. Kingsley, and with me as always, through the magic of the internet, my friend Ben Rupel. Yeah, I'm not really with you. I'm more with you virtually. <laughs> it's like right? a virtual presence. <laughs> I feel you here, but I can't see you. And and Brian, pray tell why are we not doing this in the same room in the studio today? Because there's a global pandemic, Ben. What? You're, yeah, you're, you and I are being responsible and uh, social distancing or physical distancing, as they call it nowadays. So I want, I, I've been practicing, so I've been practicing for this all my life, social distancing. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to miss it when it's gone. I bet. I tell you, <laughs> going back to normal life, what's normal? How would I know? I don't, ah, what you, can we do? Well, I don't have an excuse to just stay in my pajamas all day. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is like shelter in place. I'm like, oh, Tuesday, gotcha. <laughs> how you right. how you how you putting up with the social distancing, Brian? It's good, honestly. As far as uh, I go, this is pretty much normal. I see people very occasionally, and I talk to a lot of people over the internet. So this is just you know, call me a gamer like yourself. This is just normal living. Yeah, I, I'm not having. It's not taking a toll on me, my mental, my my psyche too much. Right. Um, the one good thing is that my it sounds like your wife's doing a lot of work on the computer teaching and stuff yes as a teacher she's busting butt yeah she's doing on she's on video conference with uh with kids all the time doing stuff and then my wife's in the medical industry so she is work as normal um probably more work than normal yeah but some people man are (laughs) not taking it well not at but all. We're here for you guys every other Wednesday as we do to bring you another true crime podcast about people in and around the music business and their misadventures in the law breaking. And this week is no different, COVID or not, we're going to bring you another episode. Okay. I am excited. And, well, and right. just so our audience knows, <laughs> they're all listening to the background music. Oh, I yeah. can't, the way we have to do this on the, on the internets here, I can't hear any of the background music. So. When it comes to playing guest the guest, I'm not going to get to hear my fun little music. Ugh. No, no, you won't hear the magical m- melodic sounds of Kevin McLeod and the uh, hustle song that he wrote for us. Uh, All right, but well, are you we're ready sti- for guest the but guest? But we're still doing guest the guest. Oh yeah, yeah. No, you're just okay. gonna you you can pretend, uh, but you got like I don't know two minutes right now. You, you'll see the little okay. wave down there. You see that wave? That's your time. Oh yeah. So we're starting. I said okay. All right. Guess the ghost. All right. You're actually very close. Um, you're never going to get this. This, this guy, <laughs> All right. you're not. I mean, okay. Uh, he's Italian. <laughs> Was, maybe. Well, right. No, Ooh, no guesses too, on Italian. Too soon. Uh, his name is Giuseppe. <laughs> Giuseppe. You know any famous Giuseppes? I know a guy named Giuseppe. He works. Do you for, really? Yeah, he, he's from Sicily. He works oh. for uh, uh, the um, Royal Oak uh, uh, Road Commission, street people, water people, you know, like the the, 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 the the city. The public works. Yeah, public works. And he makes wine in his bathtub. Or oh, wow. he makes wine. He makes homemade wine. It's great. Just that. Bathtub wine, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think they stomp it with his feet. I, I'm not kidding. I think. Wow. Uh, maybe I'm just re- Lucille Ball. Okay, well, gonna, Giuseppe. I, I guess Giuseppe, Giuseppe then, Brian. Giuseppe. All right, it is Giuseppe. Um, we're just gonna woo! Mark that one up for a win. Woo! We got you a Ric Flair woo right there. You didn't hear. Yes, <laughs> all right. Born April 8th, 1692. It's Giuseppe Tartini. Oh, wow. He's 1692. He's all right. very old. Yeah. All right. April 8th, 1692. Uh, born in Piran. It's the Republic of Venice. It's now called the Republic of Slovenia as part of Czech or Slovenia. How do you spell that? Pir- Piran. Is that? P-I-R-A-N. Piran. Okay. Yeah? No. I, when oh, there I are, thought you knew. Wasn't there a, a salsa water or something? Pirani? Pirani Pier, water? Perrier? Perrier. 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 Maybe that's, all right, that's probably it. Type of dog. Uh, this dude's got some parents. His name is, uh, his dad's name is Giantonio. That's his dad. And then Katarina Zigrando. I like that name. I like that Katarina. name, Katarina. Zigrando. Katarina. Uh, Giantonio was a native of Florence, Italy, and Katarina was descended of one of the oldest aristocratic Pyrenees families. Okay. So you get some royalty coming up here. Let's talk about this place, Piran. Uh, it's a town in the southwestern Slovenia off the goal, uh, the Gulf of Piran in the Adriatic Sea. So it's kind of like a Gulf 
coast town. Okay. Yeah, it's Medi- and, you know, not Mediterranean, but Mediterranean. So, But it's in Italy, right? It is now in Slovenia. So it's kind of, um, if you jump from Italy, go across the ocean, that's kind of where it is. Oh, okay. All right. All right. We're not on the boot. No, 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 no. No, okay. No, cross the sea from the boot is from what I saw. Uh, the town uh, has got a bunch of medieval architecture, like the narrow streets and the compact houses and stuff. And the name of the town probably originates from the Greek word pyros, which means red, because they had this reddish flesh stone everywhere. Okay. There you are. You're supposed to flesh stone. I go, yeah, it's a sequence of sedimentary rock layers that uh, progress deep from waters. Um, it's basically when it looks like the rocks are flowing down a hill kind of thing, you know how they sort of line up in those sort of like almost straight rows kind of looks like a Tetris game. Kind of. I didn't come here to listen about botany, Brian. You got it. Okay. Well, (laughs) anyway, (laughs) from 1283 to 1797, the town became part of the Republic of Venice. Um, It was governed by in a semi-autonomous way. They had a council of local noblemen and a bunch of Venetian delegates. Um, they, they had cool things like pirates would come to town and they'd fight them off in the Middle Ages. It's like one of those towns, those old towns, you know, old Venetian towns. And they're all being ran by the rich aristocrats in that town. Correct. That's no different than today around here, is it? No. Much <laughs> like today, a great pestilence hit the town in 1585, killing about two-thirds of the population. Well, oh, we can get a little taste of that going on here, don't we? Topical. I can relate. Uh, the last decades of Venetian rule were marked by decadence. Because they were competing with this Austrian port town of Trist. And uh, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this time when it's just like the massive uh, opulence and, and greed and sort of, you know, just rich people. It's spending way too much money on shit you don't need. <laughs> yes. I've seen, the Card- I've seen the Kardashians. There you go. <laughs> um, all right. So we got this guy, Giuseppe. Uh, Actually, Giuseppe that's a lie. I never, I've never watched any of that show. I've never uh, not one time. I think I might watch them. Are they in, are they on Netflix yet? Probably. I'll I, tell you a dark secret. I was deep into Kardashians like when they sort of first hit the scene. I'm like, these women are gorgeous. Oh my lord, and let's look at their daily life. And then you just find out that they're they don't do anything. I mean, Kim Kardashian is famous why? Cuz she's a porn star. That's how she got fame. I no thought... one remembers that part. <laughs> Nobody. Isn't she now a lawyer? Uh, she's trying to be, yeah. She's yeah. freed more people from the federal penitentiary, I think, than any celebrity else out there. Yeah, I think. I, I mean, that's notable. That's, yeah, that's Do better. good work. Yeah. I don't know. Good job. Way to go. Right. From, well, um, from porn to lawyering. I don't know which one's <laughs> worse, but whatever. It's funny you say that. We're going to get there in a minute because Tartini, I'm going to start calling him Martini because that's just how I remembered it. Let's get through his childhood first real quick. But then I'll tell you, he does, he pulls a Kim Kardashian. It's funny how this all comes around. <laughs> we did not plan this, folks. I did not. I, no. So, all right. In his childhood, uh, he begins his education in San Filippo Neri Oratorio in Peran. And okay. then he went to the College de Parde de Scoli P. de Copre. These are all fancy things. Like, if you were into violin or classical music, you're like, oh, shit, he went there? I, one of my friends is a PhD in music, and he was telling me, he's like, who are you doing? What? That's what? And I'm like, yeah, Giuseppe. All right. um, let's see. He attended this parent academy, Virtuoso. Um, basically, he went, you know, it's the 1600s. He had the smartest people teaching him stuff like music and art and literature. Well, back then, it wasn't something, and education wasn't something that the masses would, would get. It was uh, no. Well, people with money, people in, in, in prestigious uh, areas of the world, you know. I mean, not everybody just got an education. That, right. No, it was something that, I mean, you couldn't even aspire towards it. You either were set up for that with your family or you were a dirt peasant type and, of thing. And if you could get the education, you, you took it. I mean, it was, it was something that you wanted to have. Much like today, it's the way out. All right, uh, his parents did not want him to be all the aristocratic stuff. They wanted him to be a Franciscan friar. Really? Yes. Why? I wonder why. I mean, now, I, I, I... Tell I, people about the Franciscan friars real quick. Well, they were like uh, uh, priests, weren't they? Yeah, but the, what it is is the Franciscans end up kind of being like the merchant marines of the Catholic Church. They're the ones who do the commerce and stuff. They make the wine and the mead, and, you know, they distribute it out to the abbeys and, and all that stuff. 
but they do have like a religious thing that they sort of swear to like i'm gonna be pious and chaste and all this stuff yeah and they were the guys on monty python that walked through the streets banging a board on their head they were the uh <laughs> bring on... out your dead <laughs> no not that guy oh god too close Sorry. and then they were the guys in robin hood wasn't there friar tuck was on there yeah friar tuck is a franciscan friar yeah good example and so there's think of friar tuck and there's also yeah tuck. and there's also a group of dudes that still make some Really good Belgian style beers. Oh yeah, yeah, the Trappist ales. <clears throat> yeah, so you know they're important. I like these guys. They're fat. That's cool. It's usually, usually That's jolly. Cool. Yeah, fat and happy. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we got everybody <laughs> caught up on what a what a friar is. Friar is. Yeah. Uh, okay. So because he's learning to be a friar, he gets basic musical training. You know, like how to sing and how to like play pan flute and things like that and he really likes it <laughs> the He's pan like, flute well you said friar tuck and i swear there's a pan flute scene in that kevin cosner robin hood uh i don't know i think of uh what's the zanzibar guy with zan zan fear and his pan... and the pan... <laughs> master of the pan flute <laughs> all right put that on the watch awesome. watch list right. for tonight uh so he's studying to be a friar he learns about music he's like this is awesome so then he's like i don't want to be a friar anymore uh, and he studies law at the University of uh, Padua. Padua. A D U A. Padua. Pa- Padua. It's Padua. Padua or Padonia. <laughs> it's an Italian university located in the city of Padua, Italy. All right. Now, this university was founded in 1222 as a law school. It's uh, the second oldest university in Italy and the world's fifth oldest surviving university. You can still go to the UP today. I used. You... Wow, there are universities from that far ago, or from that far ago, from that long ago. Yes. That's crazy. They, huh. That's, isn't it, though? 12, I wonder what, 22, you're like, huh. <laughs> I wonder what their endowment funds are. I mean, they've been doing it for a long time. Well, how small are the bathrooms? I mean, geez. <laughs> I got to take a Padua number one. <laughs> Notable people who attended UP. Um, there's a lady named Elena Carano Piscopo, Pis, Pis, Piscopia. She's the first woman... Uh, ever to receive a doctor of philosophy degree like in the history of time <laughs> she was number one number one alexandros uh markadokadas the prime minister of greece okay and then uh vasilius known as the founder of modern human anatomy he was offered a perse- professorship at padua but he died before he could start the job okay and then finally if you want a notable student to graduate from your college it's got to be this guy Nicholas Copernicus mathematician and astronomer astronomer the guy who placed the sun at the center of the solar system and destroyed the church's belief system with science he and, went there too and gave us the joke all right whatever copernicus <laughs> nice nice job copernicus now we're lost uh giuseppe goes to the same school no, okay. see, he he went there, he did study law, but he also became a skilled fencer, like sword fighting. Uh, <laughs> so, sidebar. Defend. Job. So, when I first started my job that I'm in now, what, 15 years ago, 16, whatever, years ago, um, I was handed a, a packet of, of clients, um, all my di- customers. I started out with a handful of them, you know, to get to kind of get up and running in sales. Right. And so I got this list and I see that one is the De- Detroit fencing, uh, Detroit fencing, it was called. And I'm like, oh, OK, these guys make fences. They install fences in your yard, you know, picket fences, wire that fences, kind of fencing. Yeah. whatever, big fences for prisons. I don't know what I'm getting into here. So I go I, 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 I go to the address and it's a small building and there's like no sign on it. I'm like, well, this must be their <laughs> office, I guess. I'm expecting to see like a construction yard with trucks and post hole diggers and i don't know what and it was in this little tiny place in ferndale um so i walk in and there's all these dudes i mean people with those full fencing getting swords and and oh, yeah. you know, and, and i mean i couldn't had been more confused on what was going on and then it clicked it clicked it was all of a sudden there ah oh, fencing. fencing i get it i get that i get this all right, that's my that's my that's my only fencing story. You may or may not know, but I was a member of both the Flint and Swartz Creek fencing club for about four years. Oh, I remember you had that costume. That's I right. have a saber and a foil and the whole bit, and I can uh, do. I actually scored one point, one point on this collegiate fencer because I about damn near fell down, and I did like a flick, almost like a fishing rod cast with my sword, and it bent around and tapped him on the back of the shoulder before I fell down. And he's like, "Oh, you got a point." <laughs> 
Oh, I scored a point on a fucking collegiate fencer. Sweet. Dude, I've watched those guys <laughs> on the Olympics, and uh, that's, that's some fast stuff. I can't, I can't see anything they're talking about. Yeah, that's just, All of a sudden, and that's the thing. When I when I was fencing, it was literally like a flick, flick. And they just take the wrist, and they just like, and you're like, oh god. Oh, ah. So yeah, in real life, I don't think that would have killed me if that was a real sword. But whatever, we'll give you a point. Well, if you get a poke, I mean, you know, that's the thing. With it's not like slashing like a samurai sword. It's like a jab, like a poke you. So you said you had a foil and a what? Saber? Saber. Yeah, they're different. The foil is the little skinny one with kind of like the small the small little disc on the handle. And then the saber's got like the hand guard that wraps around. When you saber fight, oh. if you touch anybody anywhere, it's considered they're dead and it's a point. In foil, you got to poke people like four or five times just in it's, the chest. It's not pronounced saber. It's pronounced sabre. <laughs> like the hummus. All right, you ready? Yeah. 1710, age 18, Martini's father dies. Oh, But there's an upside. He can now marry the girl he likes. Oh. Yeah, this girl named Elisabetta Primazore. Uh, anytime we talk about, like, Italian stuff, we all got this way we talk. Uh. <laughs> uh, always. Elisabetta Primazore. Uh, unfortunately, she is the favorite niece of Cardinal Giorgio Coronaro. Cor- Cor- Corner. They call him Giorgio Corner. George, George Corner. That's her uncle. Mr. George. Mr. George. Cardinal. Okay. Sort of cardinal bishop of the area. Uh, he's a Roman Catholic cardinal and a member of the Coronoro family, a patriarchal family of ancient Rome, founding members of the Great Council in 1172. <laughs> Mafia. Uh, he had eight oh, palaces I, I, on the Grand Canal in Venice at different times. No coughing. Okay, Brian? Cover. <laughs> yeah, You're right. You're supposed to I'm cover sorry. your face with your... Gee. Mafia. Uh, they don't explicitly say that, but, you know, he comes from a large, powerful Italian family from the old country. It's... Yeah, that eventually has close ties with Frank Sinatra. <laughs> you never know, right? It all, it's all circular. It all right, gets there. Right. So, uh, oh, here's the deal. Martini's father would have disapproved of uh, Elisabetta because she technically came from a lower social class than uh, the Tartinis did, even though she had connections to some, uh, you know, family connections she wasn't really as considered as classy on the scale of of society that's the words yeah because it was a class system they had to have uh, the right people with the right people apparently there's some type of age difference too that his dad didn't like which I, I studied and looked for it i couldn't find it it makes me believe that uh she was older than giuseppe so Ooh, cougar yeah there you go. <laughs> cougar hunter my wife's older than me not by much. Won't make that mistake again. Uh, Mart- <laughs> Martini and Elisabetta get married in secret. And then 1713, three years later, Elisabetta's uncle finds out, the mafia cardinal guy, about their marriage. And uh, he has Martini charged with abduction of his niece. I guess what? <laughs> if you're the ma- mafia, you make some rules up as you go. Hey, he, he, I didn't say he could marry her. He abducted her. Um, Cardinal Giorgio there, George Corner, tries to have uh, Martini arrested, but they can't find him. So what he did was he put on a disguise. He disguised himself as a monk, uh, you know, and then uh, flees the city. He still had his outfit, his monk outfit <laughs> closet. <laughs> he just took, it's like, uh, I just got to put the hood up, change the hair. And, and shove a pillow in the belly. Uh, eventually, he finds refuge in Assisi. Remember that? Assisi. A, a Fran- is this is where the Francis of Assisi came from. Exactly. They, they, right. There's there's Franciscan friars out there. So again, he hangs out with his church buddies, and um, there he, he's a friar at the monastery in Assisi, hiding out from uh, George Corner, mafia mob. In Assisi, he begins to study the violin with Father Bomio and uh, plays in the Covenant or uh, the Convent Orchestra. So not a total loss. Got the convent that, orchestra? That sounds kinky. It does. It says convent orchestra. After about two years in a CC, Martini is recognized uh, by some visitors from Padua, his home city, while he's playing. They're like, we're going to introduce this guy to CC. He's been here only a couple years. I think you're really going to like him. Martini. Yay. And he goes up and plays. And these people are like, that guy looks like the guy who married the mob cousin. And, and, and... Hey, hey, you're not even supposed to be in here. We, I'm sorry, my dog's scratching her neck, cousin. Oh, I thought that was your wife showing you her new, uh, her new paparazzi bling. <laughs> no. So, uh, hey, you're not long... supposed to be in here. So he's so playing. He's, he's playing, and playing some people stage. in the crowd recognize him. 
Right, a curtain blew aside during the performance, and they're like, that's the guy. So uh, he gets called out, but luckily, because he's so good at the violin, George Corner's like, I've heard good things about you. You you can live. So he takes the death mark off of Martini. And, oh, uh, so the mafia guy said he could live. Did he let him have his wife back? He did. His wife is back with him also. Everything is forgiven. When, you know, when you're a talented musician or actor or celebrity, people let you do whatever they want. Different so. set of rules. Different. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Just it. Everybody's like, why are all these celebrities getting the COVID test before us? And it, I said, it's simple. They They're money. famous and have money. Yeah. That? Yeah, what was it? I think Kentucky was like, we have the lowest reported cases of uh, COVID out of the, every state. And some dude is like, yeah, nobody's tested anyone. Well, I did see one meme. It says, pretty low numbers. I'm going to have to cough on a rich person to see <laughs> and wait for their test to come back to see if I have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad plan. All right. Back in here in the world of uh, 1716, legend has it that when Tartini heard... Francisco uh, Maria Versini's playing the violin. Dude was like, that's the man. And I'm super impressed, and I suck. And so with a desire to master the violin, he flees to Anaconia, and he locks himself alone in a room to practice for hours and hours and hours on the violin to get better. And I know some fellows from high school who did the exact same thing on the guitar. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I, I've thought about that. You know what? One man can do, another man can do. A line from the Edge um, movie. Ooh. But I, I've, I, I, I can make some noise on a guitar. I can't say that I'm somewhat good at it even. But I've never been able to practice enough to even start to get good. And oh, it's yeah? not because... I, I just couldn't do that. I couldn't lock myself, like you said, in a room for hours a day practicing. That's, that's, that's not worth it, man. I'm not worth. A couple of examples of that, but I'm not going to tell the one of the two kids who sold their soul to the devil. You know who you are. Uh, but I will go with my friend Pipes. And Pipes was just this uh, little skinny kid that we met in high school. We called him Pipes because <laughs> he had super thin, tiny, like, pipe cleaner arms. And my buddy's like, wait, you got, a, you got some nice pipes there, bud. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so Pipes was trying to play the guitar, learned rhythm guitar pretty good, and then one summer he literally just sat in his basement doing scales, like you know, playing single notes, do 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 do, doing chromatic chords and scales and whatnot. Next thing you know, he comes back that school year, and that kid can shred. Can't play the same solo twice in a row, but dude could shred. With yeah, the, I, uh, I, the Tartini method here: just lock yourself in a room and play your damn instrument. I'm not You'll doing good. that. Not doing it. All right. Uh, Well, he was so good. He's like, you know what? I need something better than this. Uh, You know what? We're going to take a break, actually. Um, So hold that. Right now, we're going to take a break. And what I've been doing is playing uh, songs from my high school band. And I'm going to play another one right now. I'm sure Ben loves this because you can't hear it. But uh, (laughs) for everyone at home, we're going to take a little break real quick. And we're back. All right. What did you do with your break in isolation? Uh, I, I didn't go outside and talk to anybody. Uh, our buddy Matt, he went to, uh, he had to make a grocery trip uh, store run today. He's been doing oh, very good gosh. at staying isolated. Yeah. Um, but he's like, I had to go to Aldi. He goes, it was, it was a weird scene, man. Everybody was very quiet. Nobody was talking to anybody. He says they had a, a two milk limit <laughs> at Aldi's. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. He's like, uh, wh- when did this, when did, when did milk become the new toilet paper? What the heck? <laughs> 
Dude, peanut butter. People must be wiping their ass with peanut butter and frozen pizzas because every time I go anywhere around here, they're bare. Shelves are bare. Pe- peanut, peanut butter, butter well, frozen pizzas. I'll say this. Peanut butter does have a very, very long shelf life. Yeah. And... Yeah, I, I can't. I can figure peanut. I can figure out peanut butter better. I can than toilet paper. Oh, <laughs> I can't figure the toilet paper thing out. That's true. Those two are not interchangeable. In case you've wondered. Uh and and I should give a plug out to my company. We sell building maintenance and janitorial supplies, and we've had a warehouse of toilet paper forever. We've never ran even come close. We don't sell the kind that you buy like at the store for your own personal house. You we sell, sell the stuff. Ply. No, we sell the stuff you get like by the case where the case is is like the size of a dresser, you know? I mean Oh, industrial. Like a gross of toilet paper. A hundred rolls of toilet paper in a box. I mean we could have sold it, but we're like, no, we're we're gonna keep we're hold on to that, make sure our customers can get it. That's you know, we sell hand sanitizer. That ran out a couple times. You're um, not making your own? N- no. Uh <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh just wash your hands, people. You don't need so much hand sanitizer. That's just the thing. All right, enough about that. Let's hear about uh, what's his name, Giuseppe. Uh, Giuseppe. All right. Well, much like other musicians in their twenties, uh, seventeen, fifteen. He's twenty-three. What's his like last the, name? Giuseppe Tartini. Okay, and you said Martini a couple times. I've said it a couple times because yeah, because well, you said that, and I'm like, that's weird because I not only have a Giuseppe as a customer, one customer, a different customer, his last <laughs> name, and he's he's. He's been he's passed away since uh, his oh, last name was Martini, Lou well, Martini. That's a cool name. As long as he's dead, Lou Martini is. Oh yeah, he was a uh, he was a war. He, he fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He was a cool dude. Wow, he's a badass I've been dude. The Battle of the Bulge since I was about twelve. <laughs> Poking <laughs> in my stomach. Nobody can see that. <laughs> All right. right. Uh, so uh, Martini here is twenty three, and like most twenty three year olds and these musicians, he's like, I got to buy some new gear. So uh, he appears to be the first known owner of a violin created by Antonio Stradivari. Yeah, so, that, I was gonna. One, I was wondering if that was gonna come up. There's still a couple of those in existence today. People well, refurbishing this, them and playing them. And stuff. this one, this actual violin that uh, Martini had, um, uh, Stradivarius, he used it for a while. He later gave it to his student Salvini, and then Salvini gives it to this Polish composer and virtuoso violinist, Karol Lipinski upon hearing him perform, and so now the violin is known as the Lipinski Stradivarius. Oh, really? It's out there. You could go play that. A violin from 1715, you could play today. I don't think they'd let us play it. No, probably not. No, we're not allowed to touch it. I got big hands. All right, today is 1721, age 29. Uh, Giuseppe is appointed director of the orchestra in Basilica of St. Anthony's and Padua. Uh, we're going to just sort of fly through here a little bit because he does a lot of stuff. Basically, he's a music virtuoso. I assume we've gotten that point across. Let's get to some crime. Come on. Somebody shoot somebody. Well, he abducted his wife. So oh. I had that. Well, uh, not really. I mean. <laughs> we're going to get into why he's famous in just a minute. We'll get there. 1726, age 34, Martini is, uh, started a violin school of his own. And he gets students from all over Europe. He's considered like, you know, the virtuoso guy. So let's go study with him. Um, while he's in his own school, he becomes more interested in music theory, like the theories of harmony and acoustics, and less about performance. So he's really starting to nerd out. Nerd, nerd out, that's the Well, term. that's uh, people don't know it, but back in the day, and I'm not trying to, you know, paint a rosy picture like, oh, today's kids. But back in the day, like, you got so nerded out, that's what made your band good. Like, the guys who could play guitar and knew how to tweak the knobs on the amps and the, all those foot pedals and stuff like that, like music nerd and stuff, those are the guys who sounded really good. So they didn't concentrate just G, C, D. They actually were like, well, you got to have uh, your fuzz with your input delay, and then you got to compress it, and then that goes out into the distortion. But you can't have the distortion and the wah pedal clicked together because then you'll get, a, you know, like, so if you actually know how all that stuff goes together, music nerds, you're going to sound better. Ner- nerds nerds and that's what martini did so he's getting into like the composition of it all you know like consonant chords and dissonant chords and all these sort of music theory stuff you know so um all of his uh, works are violin concertis and violin sonatas so he's pretty much just writing violin music 
Um, they include some sacred works, such as Misari, which was composed between 1739 and 1741 at the request of Pope Clement XII. Clement. We haven't had a Clement in a long time. No, we haven't. No, we've had a lot of Johns and this and that. We need a good Clement. We need Clement back. I want a South American Pope. I think I, that'd be a good change. I got a bunch of Clementines downstairs. I figured those would last through the uh, apocalypse for a while. Mm. Oranges store real good. Yeah, I didn't want to get uh, scurvy. Um, speaking of things not going bad, Martini's music is problematic to the people studying it, like the scholars and editors, because he never put dates on his music. So he would also revise music that has already been published or finished years before, making it difficult to figure out when a piece was written, when it was re- revised, and to the extent of the revision. So he's doing like remixes and re-releases back in the 1700s. <laughs> They're like, oh, this is the original piece. Like, and he's like, no, I fixed it. I, now we do it this way. Like, damn it, Giuseppe. Yeah, well, they do the same thing at church, Brian. <laughs> That's true. They- they change, they change all the things you're supposed to be saying at church. They'll do that. Just, they'll, they'll do that. Sit, stand, and kneel, man. That's what I got. Mm-hmm. I'll give you that. But it wasn't important. It wasn't important to him. It was important to him to have good music. It wasn't important to, to catalog it, to date stand, no, time stand. Right, it wasn't right. whatever. He didn't and care. it really doesn't matter because Martini's most famous work is called The Devil's Trill Sonata. The Devil's Trill? Yeah, I picked Giuseppe Tartini because he's known as the satanic composer. Here it is. The Devil's Trill Sonata is a solo violin sonata that requires a number of technically demanding double-stop trills and is still considered difficult even by today's standards. Typical performance lasts 15 minutes. Here's a story on the Devil's Trill Sonata. Martini allegedly told the French astronomer Jérôme Landé that he had a dream. Now, in this dream, the devil appears to him, and the devil asks to be Martini's servant and teacher. He's like, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attend to all your needs, whatever you want. That's cool. But I'm going to play your violin, and I'm going to teach you how I play the violin, too. And so at the end of the music lesson, Martini handed the, the devil uh, the violin to test his skill. And then the devil takes it, and he be, begins to play. And the devil, it's the devil, so he's awesome. He's got this virtuosity. He's got all intense and, like, just magnificent performance, right? Um, it was said so singularly beautiful and executed with such superior taste and precision was the devil's performance that martini felt his breath taken away well isn't that a country song i've heard too hold on (laughs) uh the complete story is told by martini himself in lande's voyage de un francois in italie so the voyage of the french guy in italy says quote one night in the year 1713 i dreamed i had made a pact with the devil for my soul Everything went as I wished. My new servant anticipated my every desire. Among other things, I gave him a violin to see if he could play. How great was my astonishment on hearing the sonata so wonderful, so beautiful, played with such great art and intelligence as I have never ever conceived in my boldest flights of fancy. I felt enraptured, transported, enchanted. My breath failed me, and I awoke. I immediately grasped my violin in order to retain, in part at least, the impression of my dream. In vain. The music which I, at this time, composed is indeed the best that I ever wrote, and I still call it the Devil's Trill, but the difference between it and that which so moved me is so great that I would have destroyed my instrument, and I have said farewell to music forever, if it had been possible for me to live without the enjoyments it affords me. So, long story short, man, the devil played the violin so wicked in my dream that I shouldn't even play violin anymore, but they pay me a lot of money to do that, so I'm going to keep doing it. (laughs) I can't imagine this went over a row of a lot of clergy back in the day. Hey, where'd you get that new song idea from? Well, the devil came to me in a dream last night and showed me how to play the violin. So yeah. now I'm going to play it for you guys. No, the devil's song. All right, so do we get to hear this now? All right, let's check out the um, the Devil's Trill Sonata uh, now. It reminds me of background music for like an old black and white movie that they couldn't have audio to. You know, they played it in a theater, and then just oh, they have... use it in the they use it in the Italian job, Mark Wahlberg. Ah, uh, I don't think I saw. Did I see that? I don't think I saw it. Yeah, it's violin music from the 1700s. 
I, th I don't want to diminish this for any violinists out there. I'm not... I've heard good violin and different violin. My daughter plays the violin. Well, I feel like I could do this. They're just... <laughs> nee, 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 nee. <laughs> nee, 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 nee. It's great. Oh. I think those were the devil's trills. Oh, it sounds like country music. A little bit. Now, I'm only giving you three minutes of a 15-minute song. I'm man. not even sure I want three minutes, Brian. <laughs> I wondered. I only got uh, so far through it myself. I'm like, huh. All right, does this pick up at all down the road? No. But this was the satanic music that the clergy feel, feared, and the people were like, oh, my God, he's possessed by Satan because of this song. Yeah, he's the Jimi Hendrix of his day. All right. Um, <laughs> are we good? Right, or? We're going to fade it out. Yeah, let's fade this out. All right, we're good. We're good. <laughs> that is the Devil's Trill Sonata, Giuseppe Tartini. And uh, revolutionary, man. People thought he was possessed by Satan when he was like, yeah, the devil came to me in a dream. And said, So, all right. I know, I know you what you want to talk about, but we'll get there. Trust me. So right now we're just going to say mesmerized by the devil's brilliance and awe-inspiring play. Martini attempted to, uh, I already told you that part. Ah, here we go. Nope. Told you that part too. Okay. Here we go. Martini is mentioned in Madame Blavatsky's The Ensouled Violin. It's a short story included in the collection called Nightmare Tales, where she says, quote, Martini, oh, Tartini, Tartini, the great composer and violinist, uh, of the... 8th century was, I had to count up the X, V, I, 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 um, was denounced as one who got his best inspiration from the evil one with whom he was, it was said, a regular, uh, in, oh God, let me try this again. <laughs> well, they speak all old Englishy, man. It's hard. So that's what she said. <clears throat> <laughs> this is what she said. Quote. Martini, the great composer and violinist of the 8th century, was denounced as one who got his best inspiration from the evil one with whom he was, it was said, in regular league. This accusation was, of course, due to the almost magical impression he produced upon his audiences, apparently with that song. Uh, he inspired performances on the violin that secured him from his native country the title Master of Nations, the Sonata du Diable, also called Tartini's Dream, uh, as everyone who's heard it will be ready to testify, is the most weird melody ever heard or invented, hence the marvelous composition that has become the source of endless legends. Nor, we, nor were they entirely baseless, since it was he himself who was shown to have originated them. Tartini confessed to having written it on awakening from a dream in which he had heard his sonata performed by Satan for his benefit and in consequence of bargain made with his infernal majesty. And basically, like you're saying, this is another story instance where there's a deal with the devil, the crossroads, whatever. And modern variants are Roland Bowman's The Devil's Violin and the country song The Devil Went Down to Georgia. Is, is, the, is that song inspired in some part by this story? Yeah, basically, this was the first instance um, recorded, not, I think, in a Bible, of where the, uh, somebody makes a deal with the devil for musical fame, or specifically the violin. Or fame in general. Well, I guess there's been probably a lot of stories about people giving in to the devil for something, some worldly possession. But this yeah, is, bargain. You're, you're saying this is the one for music. Or for well, for violins. The PBS segment on the violin uh, in their series Art was titled Art of the Violin, quote, The Devil's Instrument. The violin is the devil's instrument. It's what it sounds like to me. All right. I played the know. violin for a little bit, you know, it, just like every kid sort of stumbles in and out, and, and, and it was hard. It, that's what she... Uh, no, so <laughs> the violin is just a small viola, which is just a small... Cello. Cello, which is just a small bass. I mean, come on. It's easy. I, I've never, I can't understand the way the violin works with the strings. Right. It's like a guitar. Sorry, can, Michelle. Oh. Hey, we Michelle. We can still do that. <laughs> we can still burp on. What are you drinking? Water. Oh, man, we don't have <laughs> any. <laughs> I'll go get a beer. I, I can go crack a beer. No. Um, Speaking of not being prepared, February 26, 1770, age 78, Tartini dies in Padua after almost 50 years working at his school there. Um, he has published experiments in acoustics 
instructional material, and many, many, many music compositions. He had 62 manuscripts total um, with compositions. Uh, they're housed at the Biblioteca Communicale Luciano Bernacasa in Econa, Italy, if you want to go check them out. And we have a quote from Giuseppe Tartini himself. He said, quote, you play a pretty good fiddle, son, and I'll give the devil his due, but I'll take that bet and you're going to regret because I think I'm better than you. Giuseppe Tartini, everybody. Woo! <laughs> yeah, quote pulled right out of the history bo- book. It was so on his tombstone. Then. It's still right. on his tombstone, yeah. I had to translate, you play a pretty good fiddle, son, from Italian. So was... <laughs> Google Translator. That's well, th- this guy didn't have a ton of crime. I mean, he was wrongly accused of stealing his wife. Uh, <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> and he made a deal with the devil, which I'm not sure is actually illegal. I don't, I don't know. If I don't think that is illegal. I don't know if there's so, you know, whatever, crime and music. But I did like <laughs> having <clears throat> an older, uh, I, I, I like some of the ones that aren't like current. The, you know, go back a couple hundred years. I like. Oh, yeah, fun. yeah. You learn a little something. They're not as sensationalized as what we could deliver on current people, but they're definitely something you you get to learn about. And some of the differences and some of the similarities from what you would hear from artists today and from artists a hundred, two, three, four hundred years ago are it's kind of neat. That's cool. I like that part of it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Hey, guess what? We actually have some feedback. You want to hear some feedback? I don't have to hear the noise. Go ahead. Hit the button all you want. I don't have to hear it. I I can see it. I don't have to hear it. Long as... Technical difficulties. Feedback. No. I want to share that with our audience. So Brian and I are doing a Zoom visual thing. I can see his computer screen on my computer screen. And, And, you know, computers are pretty smart these days. So Brian hits that feedback noise button. On his uh, on his on his um, little pad for noises he has, and GarageBand picked it up as feedback, and I saw a thing pop up on the computer screen. GarageBand has detected feedback. <laughs> That's good. Damn Look at that, computers, Garage man. Band. All, right, All right, what do what do we got for? Feedback? We got some feedback. Uh, we got a review. We have an uh, an Apple Podcast review. Feel free to go to Apple Podcasts and give us a review. Just say, hey, uh, I'm listening to the show. Five stars. That would be great. Or anywhere you want to leave reviews. Stitcher, uh, Spotify, all those places. But this one is from uh, Fustunchai. Fustunchai. Uh, all right. Fustunchai. Uh, love the content, um, but it's so quiet. I have to turn it all the way up and still can't quite hear. Do more country artists. <laughs> you know, in, in some of our earlier uh, podcasts, um, the audio sounded good, but it was quiet. So we're, we're, yes. we're we are working on, uh, still trying our best to bring those levels up for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's hard because everybody's systems are a little different. I think when they're listening to us, but we're tuning, we're dialing it in for a couple dudes yeah. with $30 worth of microphone equipment in the, in a basement. I think it sounds pretty good. Yeah. This whole studio was put together off of uh, eBay and Craigslist. So yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> No, but well, thank you. F- f- what fast, fast, fast? What was it? Fast, fastoon chai. Fastoon chai. Fastoon chai. I think it's somebody from Chicago. Fine, okay. Yes. Or China. They were all in the quarantines, you know. So maybe that's it true. Was them. Maybe we actually don't have one Chinese download, but I feel like that's more regional. Well, we're locations. not allowed on their internets. No. <laughs> we're not allowed on. They have their own internets. Well, because Ben's talking about China, it's kind of time for us to get going out of here. This week was fun and new and different. Did you did you like it? I mean, this was okay. Oh, I, I, we we I think it's it's a it's like we just started doing podcasting. We're just figuring out this uh, not being in the same room thing. So not too bad. Pretty good. I like it, and I don't. I don't know. I don't know what to say. It's <laughs> it, it's it's this or nothing. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't have nothing. We got it. We got. We tell people every other Wednesday, and damn it, sometimes I'll admit, I will admit, sometimes it's a Friday or a Thursday late night. But uh, I try to get at least some type of content every other week for you, and I didn't want this one to be any different. So if you would share with a friend, tell you, tell your friends, go, hey man, if you get, if you're super bored and and don't have anything else to do, listen to these guys. Your life can't be as boring as them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, All right. I, Brian gets mad at me when I make fun of us. So there, he had he had to right. get in there a little bit. We'll switch in, and what I'll you, go self-deprecating. Self-deprecating. There it is. Self-deprecation. 
All well, right. So, uh, what more? Do you want to sign off? Or what are you, are you ready? Do you have no, more to good. say to the people? Rock and roll, baby good? boy. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the first uh, remote podcast that we've tried. Let us know your thoughts and comments anywhere you get your podcast. Stitch your iTunes uh, thing. Go to our website. It's funcrimeandmusic.com. You can see some cool pictures. Leave us a voice message. Go down to our speak pipe. We haven't had one of those in a while. So check it out. Uh, like the song says, never trust a big butt and a smile. I don't know what to say from that in the same room when you talk about butts now, Brian. Yeah.